Um, this is Dan Silverman from SAN. Uh, if you came to the Zoom room looking for a long discussion about accordions, you came to the wrong place. Today we are talking, as always, about data authorization. Uh, but our first guest today, we're really excited, is Kellen Whitcock from University of Colorado with the University Council there, Research Council. You guys can see the, the title. Um, she's going to talk to us about Secretary of State compliance and how they've worked that at her institution. Take it away. Uh, Kellen and Erica, either of you, can you hear me? Okay, sorry, I was muted. I'm here now. <laughs> okay, great. Um, sorry about that. And I have a PowerPoint. Is there a way for me to share that with the group? Um, if not, that's okay. I don't know if I can switch. Um, why don't you start without it and I'll see if I can uh, put you to presenter, give you presenter powers. Okay. Um, well, hello everyone. As Jan said, my name is Kellen Whitcup and I am research counsel at the University of Colorado um, and I sit in Boulder. I'm going to be speaking to you today about Secretary of State Compliance, um, Erica Swain, the Assistant Director for Compliance and Authorization in our Office of Data, Data Analytics, noted the broader community curiosity surrounding this issue, so I'm, I'm really excited to speak with you all today. Um, you know, as, as a lawyer, I need to start, of course, by making a disclaimer um, that my presentation is meant only for educational and informational purposes. So I need to make clear that I am not and cannot provide legal advice to any listeners on the call or their institutions, and I am not and have not agreed to represent anyone or their institutions, um, and I recommend consulting with your counsel's office um, or other legal counsel um, to further discuss um, this issue and its application to your institution. Um, I also want to note that my presentation is geared specifically towards brick and mortar institutions that offer online distance education to students who access that education from various states. Um, but as you'll see throughout the presentation, the analysis can be adapted to other situations if that doesn't fit your institution's context. We will have um, a short Q&A at the end if there's time. Um, and uh, if we can put my PowerPoint up, my PowerPoint is not going to be um, available for various reasons, but Erica and I are working on a document that she could potentially share um, with a wider audience. Um, and so we will follow up with that. So first, um, <clears throat> in terms of what are we talking about? Obviously, this audience has vast experience in state authorization, so I'm not going to attempt um, to educate you all on that. But I do just want to give context for the issue of Secretary of State registration compared to state authorization. So, of course, state authorization is the process by which states regulate higher education institutions offering educational activities in their states. There are federal regulations requiring institutions to be authorized in those states um, where they offer online distance education. And for almost all states, institutions can meet those requirements as member institutions of SARA. Secretary of State registration, on the other hand, is a state-specific process um, which outlines various registration requirements for corporate entities that conduct business in that state. These requirements are set by individual state statutes, which mean they vary from state to state. Um, we have very little legal authority or guidance in this area. I will talk about um, the SAN survey that was conducted a little bit later in the presentation, but in terms of legal precedent, we just don't have a lot to go on in this area. <clears throat> so assuming that a given institution must be authorized in its, each state, um, do they also need to register with the Secretary of State is the baseline question. And I should clarify that, as I'm sure you all are aware, a state could theoretically require Secretary of State registration as part of its state authorization, authorization process. But with the advent of SARA, which obviously does not require that, 
um, I think this is largely a moot issue um, or just not applicable. And so this presentation discusses the registration question as an independent and separate question from state authorization. <clears throat> Um, so in my, in my PowerPoint, um, I had a great picture, with, which Erica actually sent me, <laughs> of um, a foggy dock uh, with lampposts um, going down the sides. And I was going to use that, that picture to say that, in my opinion, this represents the legal landscape um, surrounding this question. Hey, we don't have second. any. Um, oh, yeah. Ellen or, or Erica, if, if either of you wants to um, email me the present the PowerPoint, I can probably pull up your hand. Thank you, presenters. Otherwise, but if you email it to me now, I could pull it up. Sure. Um, or if you don't have to. Um, I'll probably proceed without it. Is that yeah, okay? at this point, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, anyways, because we don't have any definitive legal authority um, in this area, it's not a bright line black and white issue. Um, any of you who've worked with your counsel's office probably get that answer on quite a few issues, um, but this is definitely one of those where it takes some wading into the different considerations to try and um, flesh out a resolution. Um, we can look at several specific issues to guide institutions through this foggy landscape. And for purposes of today's presentation, I've identified four um, that institutions can consider when they're conducting their legal and risk analysis. Um, this list is obviously not exclusive, um, but should provide some foundational guideposts. The first consideration um, is the type of institution. This will weigh significantly on the analysis um, in terms of what kind of entity we're talking about and what that entity is doing. Um, second is public policy considerations. Third uh, is each state's individual statute on the registration requirements and the language of those statutes. And then fourth, any other considerations um, like administrative burdens and the consequences of not registering. At the end of the day, I also want to be very clear that each institution's legal and risk analysis on this question will be very fact specific to the institution situation. This is one of those areas of the law where it's very fact dependent um, on what exactly is occurring in each situation. Um, so first, uh, considering what type of institution are you and what are the implications of that? For example, um, CU Boulder is a public institution, meaning that we are a state entity. Colorado law grants significant and unique autonomy and protections to the university as a state entity. So accordingly, our analysis should consider that unique legal position um, squared with potential legal requirements um, set by other states for purposes of Secretary of State registration. This analysis may be different for other institutions, even within the same home state or even looking at um, the same states for purposes of registration requirements. For example, here in Colorado, the University of Denver is a private nonprofit institution, so their analysis will likely look different than CU Boulder's, and it will likely look different than, for example, Colorado Technical University, which is a private for-profit institution. Um, Underlying this analysis as well is the question, what kinds of activities is your institution conducting in other states? A brick and mortar institution offering online classes across the country um, may look different than a wholly online institution, which may look different from a brick and mortar institution with faculty and staff located elsewhere throughout the country. Again, that gets back to considering the specific context um, in which your institution operates and understanding the implications of those. <clears throat> um, second are some public policy considerations that institutions can look to. Um, first, the underlying purpose of these registration laws. Um, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, summarized in a 1950s case, um, looking at the California Secretary of State statute, that these statutes are conventional means of assuring responsibility and fair dealing on the part of foreign corporations coming into the state. So essentially, these statutes were promulgated to regulate those instances when outside business entities enter the state and the state government wants to know about it. Um, this makes sense given the benefits and risks that flow from interstate commerce. So a simple example I like to use is if I own Kellen's Trucking LLC, which is a Colorado LLC, and I send my trucks to Utah to 
to go pick up goods from their vendors, my trucks um, might get into an accident with a Utah resident on Utah roads. Um, and that's why the Utah government would likely need me to register as an entity doing business in that state so that they know about that. Um, <clears throat> second, um, we've already discussed states already regulate, um, oh sorry, let me back up. So the underlying purpose of these statutes is really to regulate traditional interstate commerce. And so institutions, depending on um, the activities they're conducting, may be able to distinguish, um, for example, online distance education from that traditional type of interstate commerce. Um, the second public policy consideration, um, as we've discussed, states already regulate institutions through the state authorization process. Um, so it would seem that there may be duplication um, in terms of also requiring institutions to register with the Secretary of State. And lastly, um, even though we don't have, as far as I could find, definitive legal authority in this area, um, you can always look to other areas of the law that have similar frameworks. Here, a good one to look at is personal jurisdiction. Personal jurisdiction um, basically refers to a po the power that a court has to make a decision regarding a party in a case and to determine whether or not the court has that power, they look at the relationship that the party has to the state, including um, the types of activities. Again, going back to my trucking example, if I'm sending my trucks to Utah and they're getting into accidents with Utah residents, that may indicate that the Utah court has power over me, whereas if I'm not sending any of my trucks to Massachusetts, probably less likely. Um, <clears throat> of course, the case law in terms of higher education institutions offering online distance education um, and whether or not that leads to personal jurisdiction. The case law is sparse, but some courts um, have determined that simply engaging students located in another state in online programs without more specific activities directed at a certain state does not satisfy the requirements for personal jurisdiction. So again, another guidepost that you can pull from when you're looking at this analysis. So <clears throat> beyond these um, two threshold arguments, I call them, sorry, I'm just going to pull apart this one. <clears throat> the third um, guidepost that institutions can look at are, of course, um, the language of the specific state statutes. Uh, as I mentioned, each one is going to vary, but there are two primary questions that could guide this analysis. First is, is the institution a covered business entity under the statute? And second, is the institution conducting a covered business activity um, as outlined by the statute? Now, this analysis is difficult because each state is different and almost all of the statutes are not very clear on their application to institutions of higher education. Um, the SAN survey conducted in 2017, which thank you so much, Dan, for doing that legwork and putting that together, um, asked each state's Secretary of State's office whether their statutes apply to higher education institutions. Um, the SAM survey provides a very useful data point in an institution's analysis of whether or not they need to register um, and should definitely be consulted um, when you're exploring that analysis. Um, but in terms of you know, a legal disposition, is it legally required? Um, an, an analysis of whether that statute applies to a given institution um, would need to be conducted for a final answer on that. Um, and I had a couple of examples, but I will just talk about them briefly. So I pulled a couple of examples to show the variety um, in the state statutes, and I just kind of picked you out of the air, Illinois and Kansas. Um, and in terms of the first question, what entities are covered by the statute, uh, the statutes are very different. Illinois specifies that it only applies to corporations organized for profit, um, whereas in Kansas, the statute gives you more of a menu of types of corporate entities um, and leaves and is, is not as clear as just for profit or not. Similarly, for covered activities, most of the statutes are oriented in, by providing a list of things that do not constitute transaction business and say everything else would qualify. Um, the Illinois and Kansas statutes, you know, there's about 10 to 15 different types of things that don't constitute covered activities. They have some overlap and they're also very different. So again, at the end of the day, it's 
it's a difficult analysis because there's so much variety on the state by state level. Um, and lastly, uh, some other factors to consider. Um, first is the burden of the registration requirements, which may be significant. Uh, institutions will have to pay fees to the Secretary of State's registration office, both when they initially register and then in most cases annually to maintain their registration. Um, a lot of states will also require the institution to have a registered agent in each state, which is effectively an agent um, that's authorized to accept service on their behalf. They have companies that provide this type of service, of course, for a fee. Um, so this all adds up to potential time and cost burdens um, on an institution. Um, another factor con to consider um, are the consequences of not registering. These will be set by, st by statute. So I know I sound like a broken record, but again, <laughs> it's going to vary. Um, and they can range from a notice um, of noncompliance to um, the no ability to access that state's court systems to the attorney general having the ability to seek injunctive relief against an institution, basically saying stop offering your improper educational activities here, um, to fines, which can add up to you know, thousands, hundreds to thousands of dollars per year. Um, so that concludes um, my presentation. Erica, do you have anything to add? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Other than, are there any questions? <laughs> Hi, this is Cheryl. Um, I just wanted to jump in and thank you all for going through all of those um, those viewpoints um, for us to take a look at, at how the Secretary of State um, issue affects us. And I appreciate that you confirmed that it really is um, personal to the institution that they're going to need to assess that um, by looking at statute and determining their activities based, you know, from their institution. So I, I appreciate that outlook because it's really challenging. We all want to be able to get to some black and white answers, but you've you've shared with us how gray it still is, and and many of these things, you know, that we have in regard to um, the activities of the institution. So um, your process to move through it too was was really helpful to explain that. So thank you very much for your thorough explanation, Kellen. You're welcome. Thank you for that feedback. And um, yes, I, I wish I wish my answer was that it was you know a clear yes no. Here's how you do it. Um, but uh, unfortunately, it's, it seems to continue, continually be murky. And so until we have some more type of definitive guidance, either from individual states or some other type of authority, um, conducting this type of fact-specific analysis um, is the way that you know, we think it, it makes sense to arrive at, at an answer. Well, I appreciate the idea that the institution staff members that we have here on our SAN call and, and other compliance staff members, you know, should work within their institution to try to come to this answer, that it's not something that sitting at a compliance um, staff members, uh, cube or, or office, you know, really would assess on their own, that it is something that needs to be in conjunction with another office at the institution. We have a couple of questions coming in. I don't know, Kellen, if you're prepared sure. to answer some of these off the cuff. I think you are. <laughs> sure. Um, so I see one um, from Russ asking, are Secretary of State offices getting better at answering questions about what an institution has to do? Um, I, I think um, the individual at SAN who could work on the survey would probably be best to answer that. Um, for purposes of my presentation, I didn't really look at that. Um, and I would just go back to Secretary of State offices asking them is a great data point. Um, if you have the time or inclination to do so, definitely a good idea. Um, but it doesn't equate, you know, to a full legal and risk analysis as we've described here. Um, <clears throat> also a question from Leanne, any guidance on how to search state statutes to get to the relevant area of the statute? Um, that is a great question. <clears throat> um, some of the state statutes are very well organized. Um, I'm thinking of Kansas, actually right off the top of my head. Um, and it's all contained within um, a <clears throat> kind of a full subpart of their state statutes and they're titled appropriately. And you can kind of navigate to covered entities, covered activities, or you know what's not covered, I suppose, um, and then consequences. 
I believe the SAN survey, one of the great parts of the SAN survey also is that it um, includes a lot of citations to the relevant statutes. Um, you could also search for those. Your counsel should be able to pull those up for you. Um, if that's not an option, you should be able to also access those through the Secretary of State's website for um, each, uh, each state. Um, some of them may take a little bit of uh, clever searching to get to. I know, for example, Utah, it's not a Secretary of State. I forget off the top of my head what they call their office, but it's something a little bit different. You effectively just trying to need to navigate your way to the um, governmental department responsible for overseeing businesses. I was going to say, and Rennie just shared a really good link that I also looked at before um, that helps you get to those S uh, Secretary of State websites. Um, so thanks, Rennie, for doing that. I'd completely forgotten to add that to some of the stuff that Ellen and I looked at. So thank you. <laughs> Department of Commerce in Utah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and, and to go back to Kellen's point that everything's different for each institution, there's three in, there's three campuses in our system. There's ourselves in Colorado Springs and Denver. And this applies to all three of us differently because of the education that we offer. Here in Boulder, we don't have any medical or nursing programs, yet those two campuses do. So there may be some different aspects of Secretary of State recognition that they have to contend with that we don't. Uh, so it's, it is really a case-by-case -case basis. So we're getting some good resources here in the chat. I think we have time for one more question, if there is one. Oh, yeah, there's a really good one that just came in. This last one here. So um, question, uh, as a newbie, we are offering pilot summer courses this summer. Are you calling the Secretary of State offices first or searching the statutes first? Um, <laughs> as a lawyer, I'm going to say uh, the statutes are going to be my go-to for um, understanding the requirements and conducting this analysis. Um, I think, again, calling the Secretary of State's offices is useful, um, you know, in those instances where the outcome under the statute may be unclear or when your institution is conducting, um, you know, more so a risk analysis of, okay, what do we think, but what are the cost, pros and cons? Um, of not registering if you know you have a lot of students in a certain state and you talk to that Secretary of State's office and they say no this is definitely a requirement um, not again not a dispositive legal analysis but a, a point in your data set um, for trying to assess assess the risks of whatever direction you decide this is Cheryl if I could just add to that a little bit I appreciate you sharing yeah. that that you know you should review the statutes first and I have to say you know especially um, folks that are, are new with our network, um, those that have been around with our network for a while will recall that we always suggest that you do your research first before you make calls because when you are able to talk about what the language is of the regulations and, and be able to point out where you have um, some uncertainty about the applicability, um, you're much more likely to get a response from the person on the other end of the phone. Um, so it's certainly much better to have a foundation before you start asking questions. Um, uh, we heard from regulators, you know, this goes back many years, that they were very frustrated with folks that just called without having any kind of basis of understanding the topic area. So, um, so thanks for confirming that. I really do appreciate it because we do want to make sure that um, we're getting to the answers as quickly as possible and the way that that does it is if there's research done first. Exactly. Um, and, and to follow up on that, Cheryl, thank you for that um, addition as well. When you, if you do call Secretary of State offices, um, again, I, I don't think that's necessarily, you know, ever a bad idea to just gather information. Um, also, just be aware of the individuals that you're talking to at the Secretary of State's office, um, because it might be unclear, you know, what their authority is or what, you know, their understanding, their working knowledge of the statute that actually governs their office. Um, so that's that's also something to just be mindful of as you're kind of gathering more information on that data point. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Kellen. Thank you, Erica. Thanks to all of you in the chat. Uh, we really appreciate this and, and giving us a lot to think, think on. Yeah, thank you all so much for having me. So we're going to move on now to the next item on our agenda. Uh, Lindsay, are you, are, do you read me? Yes, I do. Hi there. Hi. Okay. So um, 
this, this is a, a project that we're working on here at SAN to address the issue that happens, that happened to many of you, at, at all of you at one point, which is you become a SAN coordinator. And some of you have had experience with state authorization before that, but for a lot of you, it was just thrown on your desk and you were, really were a total newbie. So what we have been doing is saying, hey, look, we've got this great website, read it. And we're, we've decided that while that is useful, we, need, we would like to give people a more guided way of working through our resources, working through our materials, and in a fun way, ideally, which is why this is our first crack at, at badging, if you will. So we've, we've, we've designed a, you know, a, a challenge, a fun, way of, a, a fun way of doing this, I guess. I mean, it all depends on your definition of fun, of course, um, but an amusing way. Um, of going through these and we're using a new technology, which is our mix. We have a new channel in WCET mix. And um, Lindsay is our resident expert on mix. So she's gonna talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks Dan. Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Lindsay Downs. Uh, I'm commonly known as the email lady for WCET, uh, but my actual title is uh, the Assistant Director of Communications, Community and Social Media. Um, and I am also the community manager for WCET Mix. If you haven't heard of that, that is the platform that we host our member communities on for SAN and WCET. Basically, this, the, these communities replaced our old listservs. Um, so when you get those emails from SAN coordinators or for the SAN network with questions or information, those are actually coming from Mix. Uh, this platform can be used purely as email back and forth, sort of like the old listservs, or you can log in to the website. It's wctmix.witchy.edu, see all the communities and participate uh, online. Uh, we're using this platform, like Dan said, for a new fun way to get new coordinators onboarded to, um, to understanding the website and kind of have some great background information. And basically what this platform will allow us to do is kind of gamify the experience. So we're going to be sending out um, welcome emails that have information on the journey to be to becoming or to getting all the information you need as a new SAN coordinator. Uh, and you'll go through uh, this journey with these great graphics of mountains and and climbing the mountains and um, You'll get, there's nine modules that you'll travel through and you'll get automated emails when you accomplish certain tasks. Um, the tasks aren't anything too crazy. It's just really to, to make sure that you have information and you've received it. Um, you'll be able to post in this discussion forum and that's what actually triggers the next, um, <laughs> gamify is the word you were using for, yes. Um, so the, when you post in the discussion forum, it will trigger the next automated email. Um, and then Dan and Cheryl and I will be um, in the community if people have questions or, or need assistance. Um, and in my opinion, the coolest thing about this program is when you finish all nine modules, you get a really amazing badge that has been designed just for this program. And it will be on your profile in Mix. Uh, so you can show off your shiny virtual badge that you were onboarded <laughs> for Stan. Um, and Dan and Cheryl, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I know that we are totally fine with other people taking this. It doesn't have to be someone that is new um, in the future. But well, Lindsay, thank you so much. Yeah, you, you, yeah. Uh, you stepped right up there. Um, <laughs> we needed it. Uh, so basically, in this initial phase, we're really looking for anyone in this, in this group beta testers. We, we, we think it's going to work, but we know they're going to be kinks and we know it can be better. So um, maybe after this call, let me know or let Lindsay know or let Cheryl know if you would like to be put into this mix group as a beta tester. Um, the good thing is too that once, once all nine modules are posted, you don't necessarily have to wait. I mean, you can, you can do them all at once. You don't necessarily have to do one, wait for the next email to come and do the next. So there, it's not seed time, it is a little more competency-based, um, which we're excited about as well. Um, so 
anyone is interested. When it's not quite ready to roll yet, but it will be soon. And um, if anybody would li like, I say, would anybody would like to participate as a beta tester, that would be great. The other thing is we're we're thinking about opening up not just a new coordinators, but maybe new contacts at larger memberships or smaller memberships who are interested in learning more. Um, so, but it's it's originally designed for for new coordinators, but we do need your um, your help first. Um, there are there any other questions? I had a question that came to me privately, which was how long will it take to complete all nine modules? Um, well, I guess we don't we don't really know. Um, I would say, depending on your familiarity with the website when you're starting, each one probably takes, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. Lindsay, what would you think? Yeah, I think, sorry, I was typing in the answer to a question. Um, yeah, I think that that seems about right. Uh, we could definitely um, know more about that through the beta testing. Yeah. And uh, we will, I think it makes sense to try and keep it under 15 minutes, but a lot of it is, you know, hey, you're learning how to navigate a website, you're learning how to go and find resources. So some of it will be based on how much time you want to put into that. But, but, that's, but that's exactly right too, Lindsay, that it's, this is a skill building. This isn't necessarily going to be make you a master of sand content. It's going to introduce you to the sand content, but more importantly, allow you to then navigate the website better for yourself as questions arise on your campus and in your mind. Um, so there's been a couple of questions about how to sign up. Why don't we just simplify this? Just email me. Everybody email me if you want to participate in the beta group. Um, and um, you have you have a week or two to, to do that. Then I'll... Um, I'll work the, the yeah. I'll work it from my end. Um, thank you so much, Lindsay. Thanks everyone for your interest. And um, and uh, Lindsay, I'll, I'll see you. Uh, see you on the staff meeting in a little while. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks all. Have this was my first stand meeting, so thanks for a great meeting. <laughs> so now we are moving on to early implementation, which is a topic we've talked about a lot over the last few months. Um, and we asked for some volunteers who are in the trenches on their campuses working through early implementation. And we got two great responses. So our first one is Richmond Reyes from Texas Women's University. Richmond, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. All I'm right, good. perfect. Awesome. Well, hello everyone. My name is Richmond Reyes, coordinator for compliance and professional development at Texas Women's University. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank Cheryl and Dan for giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you about my experience with early implementation of the 2019 regulations. So at Texas Women's University, which despite how its name sound, is actually a, a public university, our work towards early implementation has been fairly smooth. Uh, we haven't yet early implemented, but we are going through the process. Our biggest successes so far include getting buy-in from executive leadership, establishment of an early implementation committee, an agreement within the committee for an implementation and compliance roadmap. The biggest challenges we've come across is adapting our technology and systems to accommodate the new disclosures, as well as getting pushback from the Office of General Counsel. So I'll start first with my successes. Uh, my department agreed almost as soon as the new regulations were released that in order for us to take this challenge of either early implementation or transition to the new regulations, that we needed buy-in from the university decision makers. Within our own office, we felt that it was actually easier to early implement than maintain compliance with the 2016 regulations. So with that mindset, we needed to figure out how to convince everyone else. We sold the idea of early implementation to leadership as an administratively less ambiguous task that serves students more effectively relative to the 2016 regulations. We pitched our idea to two separate committees, the Academic Council and the Committee of Chairs, which were made up of the deans and the chairs of the academic components respectively. Our presentation focused on the improvement in language when it came to location versus state of residence, and it assured the departments that as long as we were putting forth an earnest effort in making professional licensure or certification determinations, there would be no penalty in claiming that we have not made a determination. That pitch was enough to greenlight the formation of the Early Implementation Committee, to which I now chair. So as chair of the Early Implementation Committee, 
My job was to identify the key personnel and support staff to drive the work. The people that I've included in my committee are the associate deans of the five colleges that have programs that lead to professional licensure or certification, the IT department, the registrar's office, admissions processing, and financial aid. I also had uh, a certified project manager in my committee who I used to keep everyone on task, manage the repository of documents being created, and coordinate scheduling. What I've done in the committee is broken down the work into two sides, the administrative support, support departments and the academic departments. So before our first meeting, I did some of the legwork to identify all the programs that led to licensure or certification, and I distributed it to the academic departments for verification. After the verification, I sent it to the administrative department so they can start doing their own legwork. In that list, I included the name of the programs, which degrees would be granted, the licensure or certification the program prepares the student for, and the governing body of the license. I also generated handouts that clearly stated the goals of the committee, the goals of the administrative and the academic departments, and the tasks required to meet those goals. I also made sure to note some important considerations brought up during various WCET and state authorization network discussions, as well as comments made during the negotiated rulemaking process. Essentially, by highlighting the key points, providing guidance as to how to handle expected challenges, and establishing specific requirements for the stakeholders, the committee agreed with the course of action and are working towards completing their assigned task. But it hasn't all been smooth. One of the biggest challenges we've come across is how we're supposed to adopt our current enrollment and application systems to meet the new demands. In Texas, all public universities and participating community and private institutions use the same system to apply for admissions. We originally wanted to utilize this system for the uh, general disclosures, but realized with the amount of variables involved and the limitations to the custom modifications we would need, it simply wasn't possible. I'm leaning very heavily on my IT department's programmer to come up with a solution that allows us to accurately and automatically identify students that need a disclosure statement. One major issue we're addressing is the timing for disclosure distribution for programs that don't admit students until they complete a certain amount of time or credit hours. We've come to the conclusion that we'll need to create new major codes to ensure timely distribution for disclosures for students who are in pre-major or in, are considered to be in entry-level programs. So in theory, we have the ability to identify all these students already, but because there are different databases holding different types of information that are managed by separate departments, our job is really to make sure all of these databases communicate with one another, with one another to generate reports. The other part of the headache lies with the automation of disclosure distribution. We have a CRM that deals specifically with workflow automation, but again, with so many variables and inputs, we haven't yet found a way to elegantly integrate it into the process. While I'm confident that eventually we'll come to the correct solution as far as data management goes, I can't say the same thing about dealing with the Office of General Counsel. Unlike the issues with management of information and databases, dealing with the Office of General Counsel is a matter of difference in philosophy rather than technology. The academic and administrative departments in my committee understand that these, these disclosures are ultimately meant to help students make informed decisions. General counsel is more concerned with exposure to legal liability of the institution and would prefer that if we just say we haven't determined or made any determinations for every single program from now until eternity. But for now, we'll be playing it by ear since uh, we're not making too many determinations this first year, uh, but going forward, we are expecting an uphill battle. So for anyone who is interested in early implementation or curious as to how to make a transition to the new regulations go as smoothly as possible, I have three pieces of advice. First, determine who your stakeholders are, discuss the requirements of the regulations with them and gain their support. This is a very complex project with a lot of moving parts and the more input and feedback that you receive from people, the more effectively you're able to plan your course of action. Additionally, these people will ultimately be the ones who you go to in terms, in terms of trying to get work done. So you'll need to really think about who should be involved and trust in their expertise. Second, you want to break things down and set clear goals for everyone who's involved. The big picture is actually fairly easy to envision with this project, but you'll need to spell out what you need accomplished by every individual so things don't fall through the cracks. Utilizing some shared online workspace to make communication transparent and keep everyone accountable can also facilitate the progress. You may find it helpful to break the actual work down into phases and annotate what work needs to get done in each phase. This is a good way to create milestones to keep everyone motivated to keep pushing. At TWU, I decided to break down the project into two phases, the preliminary year and the ongoing years. The preliminary year is the start of the project to when we officially early implement the 2019 regulations, 
and the ongoing years is everything after the date we early implement. Lastly, you want to set realistic expectations of yourself and everyone else. Early implementation of the new regulations is a large undertaking, so don't get frustrated if things take longer than you want or expect. TWU is aiming for an April 1st implementation date, so that'll account for the new systems and processes being built, testing, and unforeseeable delays. It's important to remember, though, that whatever you create does not have to be perfect right off the bat. You'll always have time to refine the work later if need be. So that concludes uh, my discussion on early implementation at Texas Women's University. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that you have if, as long as we have time and as long as uh, Ronald is able to get through his presentation as well. Richmond, that was great. Um, clearly, um, I just really appreciate how thoughtful and thorough that presentation was. I think what we'll do is have Ronald go and then um, have questions jointly for both of you guys after that, just to make sure we get to them. So Ronald, are you, are you yep. ready and able? All right, great. Um, actually, this is going to kind of work out um, different or not how I expected it um, because I think Richmond just did a great job of, explaining kind of the process of getting it set up on your campus. And I'm gonna be discussing more of the details about researching and finding those pre-education requirements for your degree programs um, and some of the issues that you're gonna run into as you start to collect data um, for your different programs. And I need to Change screens here real quick. Get my notes. Maybe not. There we go. Okay. So basically, um, in 2016, 2017, Northern started um, going through the process of um, doing the research and collecting data uh, to comply with the 2016 regs. And then of course, um, we're now into the 2019 regs. Uh, we basically looked at two of our biggest programs. Uh, the first one is our professional accountancy degree, which is designed to uh, provide students the education they need for uh, certified public accounting. And the one we're currently working on is our counseling uh, degree program. And so I'm going to kind of talk about each one of them a little differently. With the CPA, um, one of the things that we ran into is um, our faculty have this and still have this mentality that the old generic, we don't certify any of our programs lead to licensure. Uh, we can't guarantee licensure uh, and a whole host of other arguments that really don't hold water anymore. Um, that, you know, and as soon as we put them in a position where they were going out and trying to look at individual state statutes about getting licensed in their state, uh, some of the feedback I was getting is like, this is ridiculous. Th you know, this is just taking way too much time. Uh, none of it makes any sense. And I'm like, exactly. Now, imagine you're a 17, 18-year-old kid that's trying to make a decision on whether or not to go to a school uh, because their ultimate goal is to become a certified public accountant. Or in the case where we're at now is they want to be a counselor or the one that really tends to shock most of our students, those that are in psychology programs that assume that because they complete the bachelor's in psychology, they're going to go out and get licensed and they're going to be able to uh, practice as a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And of course, they get the rude awakening that, nope, you've got to go on and do a master's and or a doctorate. So we've pretty much got the faculty to realize that determining licensing requirements is way more complicated 
than anyone imagined. Um, most of the states for the certified public accountant, um, while it's difficult to go through their websites, um, some of the websites are very intuitive. And as soon as you get into their uh, website, they actually have a button at the top of the page that says licensure education requirements. And you can click that and it'll drop it down and provide that to you. Other states, you're gonna have to dig for it. Um, you can contact the states, but it's a very difficult process to get a hold of someone. Uh, as all of the colleagues earlier tonight, today were uh, mentioning, um, they just don't have the time to deal with 3,000 schools calling them consistently asking questions about their programs or their educational requirements. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Uh, one, of, uh, one of my faculty in the um, counseling program, their suggestion was that we put a statement out that we only certify that we meet South Dakota uh, requirements. And my argument to them or response to them was something to the effect of, okay, so you're basically planning to tell every student outside of South Dakota that you don't come to South Dakota because we're not going to um, tell you whether or not we meet a state education requirement. Um, the other complexity that we run into within the um, counseling program is some states have multiple levels of licensure for like counseling. Um, it's kind of an advancement thing. You start out as a, an intern and then you get licensed as a um, assistant counselor and then a counselor and then a senior counselor and but when we look at the education requirements they're all exactly the same um, it just depends on how many hours of practical experience you already have accumulated which determines which level you go so for Northern State University we plan to list each of those licenses and make the determination if we do or do not um, meet the educational requirements for that state. Um, what else? So again, I, I think those are some of the big complications that many of you are probably going to be experiencing if you have not already started looking at this data collection uh, process. And then, of course, once you collect all of the data, the faculty or academic folks have to be the ones to review it to verify that your curriculum is meeting um, that particular state's educational requirements for licensure. Um, there were a couple of states when we were doing the CPA program or Certified Public Accountant that required. Um, a very specific course or set of courses uh, in your accounting program, um, which we did not offer. Uh, and, uh, one of them was managerial accounting. So we wrote a letter to the uh, Alabama Licensing Board for Accountants and laid out for them how we integrate that particular program across uh, several courses in our uh, curriculum and they responded with uh, an exception that any student uh, completing our program will meet Alabama um, educational requirements. Um, now with counseling we found a very odd but several states the only educational requirement they have is that your program be accredited by KCREP. That was the only educational requirement, which makes it fairly easy uh, to deal with. Um, but that is not necessarily the standard in all states. Uh, some states have a KCREP requirement, but then they also have a very detailed list of 
topics that have to be covered in your program. So again, it, this is not a easy uh, program, much like anything else we do in distance education. Um, it's gonna be complicated. And in a lot of cases, you're gonna have to make judgment calls, uh, whether you do or don't, or how you process things, or how you're going to list them uh, on your website and in your disclosures. So I'll turn it back over to Dan. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions for either? And and I agree, Ronald. That was a good kind of two sides of the same coin. Uh, so a lot of rich content there. Um, anybody have any questions? I don't think I'm seeing any in the chat. Hey, uh, Dan. This is uh, Richmond over at uh, TWU. Yes. Uh, um, so one of the things that I, it's not so much a question, but it, it's more of a, a thing that was brought up at the committee meeting. Um, the meeting that I had previously, and it was, it's, it's something that uh, Ronald is touching upon is the implications from the marketing standpoint. Uh, when you say that a program doesn't meet uh, requirements uh, from a student's perspective, that could be extremely, uh, extremely bad. They would, essentially say, well, why would I go to this, this program or in, in, enroll in this program if it doesn't meet the requirements that I'm looking for? So in my committee meeting, we actually thought of an idea and we'd love to see what everyone else's thoughts are on this, is the creation of a fourth bucket for determinations. So from what I understand, when it comes to federal law or pretty much any law, federal law sets the minimum standard for regulation. That doesn't mean that you can't be even more intense or create new things that supplement those things. So this fourth bucket of determinations in theory, and we're talking to our general counsel about this right now, is uh, this program does not meet requirements, but, and then you explain uh, why it does not. And it's kind of akin to the 2016 regulations where you sort of have to explain why. But in that sense, you'll, you're able to explain your reasoning as to why uh, the program doesn't meet requirements in other states. Uh, in that way, students get some context and they're able to understand maybe what's going on and it's not a reflection of the programmatic requirements or a reflection of the quality of the institution as a whole. Uh, but it is a way to give context to students and let them think about uh, the, the, broader, the broader scheme of things and their, uh, their career goals in terms of becoming licensed or certified in other states. This is Ronald. I, I kind of agree with you there, uh, Richmond, because we're having a similar discussion uh, with our counseling and our CPA program um, because students can make the decision that okay, I know you don't meet California's requirements because they expect this particular course, but I still wanna to come to Northern and get my accounting degree at Northern and then through either online or when I go back to California, I will get that course independently of Northern's uh, degree program. So yes, we are trying to do something along that lines in our marketing materials so we don't just scare a student from uh, Illinois away from our program just because we don't meet Illinois uh, educational requirements. We want to at least have a conversation with them and let them make a more informed decision on where or what degree program they want to pursue. So it looks um, like I've got a question here from Ricky. Yeah, there, go sorry, ahead. Sorry, sorry to cut you off there. Uh, so Ricky's asking, to what extent are the non-licensure non updates considered in these early implementation meetings? Um, well, to be honest, this is a, a, a sore subject for, for the committee because we're trying to think along the lines of liability. Um, and we also don't want to have to make the 
the uh, updates too frequent. But on the one hand, it's easier to set a, a regular frequency or uh, interval in which you release these updates or these disclosure statements. So we were toying around with the idea of potentially providing these disclosures um, any time or every enrollment period. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not, uh, Ricky, but that's sort of the, the route that we're going. There were a couple other questions for Ricky's. Um, Ronald, do you have at the top of your head a, a state with the requirements of over and above KCREP? I'm sorry, what was that now? There's a question about an example of a state with requirements over and above KCREP. I think that's for counseling. Um, I think Alaska was one of those. And part of our research as we were going through Alaska, we've come to the understanding that Alaska eliminated the agency that was responsible for licensing counselors. Um, so we're, we're still struggling with um, Alaska. Um, and I don't remember the others right off the top of my head, but there were several states that had um, additional very specific requirements uh, that had to be included in the curriculum. I'll be happy to share a list with everybody. I'll send it to Dan and Dan can send it out to everybody. Even better, post it to the mix channel or SAN coordinators. And I actually think that is a good place for this discussion to continue because okay. there's obviously a lot to, um, to discuss. Um, we have a couple of things in our three minutes remaining. I think I can do it. Challenge question, easy. Nobody replied, so I don't have to give all the glory to the winners. Um, I did want to recognize we have some new coordinators. So we have Holly Hostetler from Bradley University, Brenda Snyder from Lincoln University, Frederick Roundtree from Lincoln University, Jonathan Gomez from Georgetown, Deb Bronson from University of New Hampshire, Ronald Brownie, he's been part of the network for a long time, but new coordinator, Kira Cloward from Western Governors, and Regina Dennis from University of Arkansas. So thank you all for joining our network and, and um, hopefully you will get some value out of it. Um, and I, Cheryl, do you wanna note very quickly any of the things below? Sorry, I needed to mute myself. Yes, please. Um, I just wanted to point out the events that we have coming up. Um, the NASAP's annual conference, you can find on, uh, you can find that on the SAN website, the uh, information about it, you'll notice a register code there. It's not, the, it depends that we normally use because we did not set the code. So the code there is set by NASAPS and that's how you get the member rate uh, to attend that conference. Uh, the SAN Basics Workshop in June is about two thirds um, full. Uh, so if you have folks at your institution that are still interested in the SAN Basics Workshop, I urge you to have them go ahead and register. Um, and uh, actually, Dan, I'm going to turn it back over to you to um, share who our March person is for Open Forum because I'm very excited about this. Oh, thank you. We have Julie Woodruff from Tennessee. So she's going to be available to ask everything you ever wanted to ask a state portal agency, but entity, I guess, state portal entity now, but we're afraid to ask. So we're looking forward to her presentation. Oh, and one, one final thing, it's, a, it, it's something that Dan has done great work on, is formalizing our podcast situation. You know, we were all testing it. Um, you'll notice the links there are hyperlinks, but it goes to Podbean. Um, I'm not going to pretend I understand how all this works, so I'm going to turn that back over to Dan, but I just want to give Dan all the credit in the world for um, putting us forward with a formalized way to do podcasts. So I'm looking forward to those in the future. But Dan, why don't you tell them a little bit about that just to close us out. Okay, so we have a, a name, it's called General Disclosure. We have a, a site on Podbean. We're also on Stitcher, TuneIn, Google Play. Um, so those are all places to get the podcast other than the link below. Uh, so if you're a podcast person, I hope you're enjoying it. We're thinking about adding a theme song uh, as well working on my ukulele. And we're also always looking for new guests. We have a couple more in the hopper, but if you know someone who you think might wanna do it or you might wanna do it yourself, come on. It's a very informal way of getting to know the humans behind state authorization 
And uh, you get to hear Cheryl talk about musicals and maybe some other regulatory fun. So we're having fun with it. We hope you are. Speaking of fun, let's cut this thing off and uh, we will see you guys next time. Thank you all. And thanks to all of our great guests today. Thanks, thanks everybody. Have a great, great week. Bye-bye.